Hello, everyone. This is Dale Allen, president of Dextera. Uh, I wanted to welcome you all to today's Eagle Apps community webinar series. Um, want to make sure we can welcome everyone in, provide a little overview, and get right into today's session. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us for this ongoing series. Uh, we began this with an introductory session uh, that occurred on March 19th about uh, Eagle Labs uh, in general, and that's available for everyone's review on our website. Um, there you can learn more about Eagle Labs features, uh, the need for the development of this product by Boston College, and probably from for many of us, um, the functional and te technical uh, overviews and architecture and implementation for this application-based student information system. We are really pleased today that um, we have folks that are joining us uh, with interest in Eagle Apps and in joining this community from across Europe, from India, from Canada, and across the United States. So during these challenging times where we're all uh, a little too distant from each other as we normally have been, we hope that everyone is safe, strong, and well, and really appreciate your joining us today. All of our sessions will be recorded and will be available on our the Eagle Apps page of the Dexterra website. Let me just mention a little bit about Dextera to give you the 30 second overview of that before I ask our partners at Boston College and their CIO, Mike Bork, uh, Burke, to join us as well to do the same. So first of all, Dextera is a growing international nonprofit consortium that develops shared solutions to transform the, transform the ability to control, utilize and exchange information amongst products when you want and where you want. We lead this through shared communities to bring these two solutions to our members and to hopefully transform and change the education market. Our priorities as a collective group are around developing next generation education systems like Eagle Apps, uh, developing business intelligence solutions and working on integration solutions to reduce the burden between products. We are partnering and are pleased to partner with Boston College to grow the Eagle Apps community to bring together institutions and interested parties from around the world to help better understand the parameters of an Eagle Apps implementation and to launch this global community of practitioners and contributors. This community is expected to guide the ongoing development of this enterprise level product and enable its ongoing evolution. And I'll provide more detail in a bit. With that, I'd like to pause and ask my partner and colleague Mike Burke, who is the Vice President and CIO of Boston College to share a brief welcome uh, and some perspective from his side. Mike. Thank you, Dale. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for hosting this, Dale. And thanks for the partnership with Dexterra. Um, on behalf of Boston College, I wanna thank you. And thanks to all of you taking part. I'll try to be brief here. Um, and thank you for taking time from your busy schedule uh, during such a crazy time to do this. I just wanted to spend two minutes at the beginning to emphasize what our journey has been here, because this has been a journey for us. We started out uh, shortly after the last economic crisis and joined a consortium called Kuali. And we, what we really loved about that was the idea of um, the value of a community, a community that would drive the design in terms of functionality, drive the design in terms of technology, and drive the longevity and the, the supportability of the product long-term. Ultimately, for a variety of reasons, that fell apart, and Boston College had to reassess its options. And we looked at what was available in the market. We didn't find anything that fit our technological model. Uh, we were looking for the services-oriented architecture, service contract-based model that we're using on a very broad basis on our campus, and something that we could afford to implement, something that we could do in an incremental modular manner that would be extensible and integratable, whether it was here on campus or in the cloud or whatever combination of that. So uh, it's been a long journey, but the vision included that technology, that function, and that community for the support. And now, as we've made a lot of progress, we have some modules up and running. We've actually seen the benefit in real life uh, of being actually able to change the system from our long, old, you know, long in the tooth legacy system to actually make changes in real time and have users be able to configure things based on business rules in their domain and not need programming to support it. Uh, it's, it's been great. 
So now, as we move forward, we're, you know, we've got the architecture, we've got the functionality, the scalability, the extensibility, and now we're looking to build a community. So we're not the only school on earth that ever takes advantage of this. And we think that we can actually support it more in the long term. There's the old saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go long, go together. And we needed to go fast and get it done. And we did that on our own. But now we're looking for the long run and we're looking to build a community of partners, like-minded partners that would benefit from this model. And I'm actually thinking now, given the, the economic reality, at least here in the States, and it's probably not a lot different for our international partners, uh, is you know, what is the affordability of doing these big, massive ERP systems? Something like Eagle Apps is incremental, is modular, is extensible, and uh, is achievable, I think, in, in different, at different scales. So we appreciate you taking the time. We look forward to, you're gonna learn some good stuff today in terms of getting down and understanding the reality of, of how this system is designed and how it's built. And um, I appreciate you taking the opportunity from your busy schedules. Look forward to connecting with you um, through these series and offline, whatever. But the partnership with Dexter, I think is really helping us maintain our focus on having a great product here but also having an outside perspective to say, how can that product uh, foster a community and a, a community that would serve us all well as, as partners. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I hope I'm quite certain you're gonna enjoy what you're gonna see. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and again, today is uh, uh, just a reminder of the Boston College and Dextera collaboration, as you see on the screen, is really about focusing and facilitating this engaged community, which you're all uh, we'll be, you know, exploring through this and understanding more about the product and hopefully joining into the community as we go forward. And then we're also looking to do implementation studies, which the fourth uh, uh, event in our series will be about that study. And this is a chance for some of you to be more engaged and directly testing and deploying this product to help address some of your needs, but also helping us guide the um, how do you implement? What are the best ways? How do we document that? And how can we go forward with that? So again, in a shared kind of way. Some logistics before we get, get going. Um, all are recorded, as I said before, and available on Eagle App site. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, generally on the bottom, uh, with Zoom, you have the ability to do question and answer, chat, or raise your hand. Uh, feel free to use the chat with everyone. Um, we do want to uh, get as much engagement as we can with people um, and hear from you directly. Uh, and the question answer, same thing. If it's a question relevant to what's going on, we'll try to get it addressed immediately. At the end of the session, we will also do a question and answer uh, as well uh, at the end for any remaining items. And we can continue the discussions offline as well. Um, we think the questions and answers are really important because they do help us shape the frequently asked questions uh, information that we can share with other people. Um, and again, we do have a, an Eagle Apps. Uh, at the end of this, I'll have a, an email address that you can use for any specific questions for Eagle Apps that can, if you want to share those with us. Today's session is about uh, the introduction and course lifecycle management. The dis this is the first session of the uh, web series. It'll focus on one slice of functionality related to the various tools for managing and tracking the life cycle of courses, including, including course creation, competency mapping, instructor assignment, aligning with the academic calendar, et cetera. Boston College's specific implementation will be demonstrated and the underlying models that allow Eagle Apps to be used, uh, uh, flexibility across, the, would allow for flexibility across various institutional environments will be presented. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, one of our presenters, Tom Capetto, but he's gonna be joined by Linda McCarthy and Dan, Dan Higgins. They're all with Boston College, and then we share Tom as a senior architect with Dexter. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Tom. Okay, good morning. Uh, Good morning. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. All right. Um, so as Dale introduced, uh, we're going to give you a, um, a little more in-depth slice uh, about courses and setting up of those courses in terms with their logistical information. Uh, in the last session, we 
uh, introduced the concept that Eagle Apps is composed of a modular uh, service environment um, on which we build applications. Uh, the functional domains that the service environment describes describes a large chunk of what exists throughout the enterprise. Um, so it's um, fairly complex. Uh, we have um, a lot of different um, areas and inside each of those areas, we have a lot of very specific problems or models that describe how it is uh, that we're going to design and build something. We um, cannot go deeply into all of these areas. Um, so in our last session, we kind of flew by very quickly at about 100,000 feet. Um, we're going to be going um, a little deeper today and focusing on uh, curriculum, specifically around courses um, and course offerings, which is a course that is offered uh, within a specific time period or a term. Um, so our no, all, all pun intended, our learning objective today um, is just to gain a little bit more understanding uh, onto the uh, course life cycle. And my introduction here um, will um, basically just try to set the stage so you have a little bit of a conceptual backing um, of what Dan is going to demo shortly. Um, so before I get into the course flow, my little disclaimer uh, that I work largely in the architecture and, and design area of this project. So I tend to talk a lot about capabilities, um, uh, which sometimes can vary a little bit with what you uh, see in the user interface demos. So I talk about capabilities and implementation scenarios, customizations, and how it is we can be data driven so that things are kind of changing depending on how what people set up and what people enter into the system. Um, the demonstrations you will see with the UIs, that's demonstrating Boston College uh, data, um, their implementation and their setup. So, you know, many of you come to learn about uh, Eagle Apps and very specifically to see how it might be applicable in your situation. Um, so I'm going to be a little broad and I may raise some eyebrows at Boston College about uh, uh, some of the other capabilities that maybe Boston College isn't taking full advantage of yet. So the course flow. Um, it starts with defining a course, and I mean the curriculum definition of a course. Um, and as we go through, we'll see that a, a course, we try to focus it strictly on the curricular definition. Um, I know uh, many of you from USC are listening, and we've worked a lot over the years with you on learning objectives. Um, so my nickname for a course is a bag of learning objectives. Um, all of the logistical information, a lot of the administrative information is not really part of the course, but we'll see how that kind of weaves in as, as we go along. Um, in addition to learning objectives, uh, we may talk about um, requisites, and these courses may be applied uh, to satisfying requirements in programs. Now, programs, um, uh, although intertwined in curriculum management, is a little out of scope for today's webinar. Um, but we're going to focus on the course itself. When we want to um, offer a course in a particular term, in this case, you'll see MAP 1801 being offered for fall of 2020, it is at this stage of the game that we bring in a lot of the logistical information about when that uh, course is meeting, um, who may be teaching it, um, what its uh, capacities are, and so forth. So a course offering is essentially a course in a term plus a bunch of logistical information uh, to manage the registration process. And that brings us to the next step, um, which is my course registration for the course. And so if I'm registered for Math 1801, I will see a course registration uh, between me and the instance of Math 1801 that is offered in the fall of 2020. This eventually percolates up to what we call the student course record. This is a piece of the academic record services that roll up information um, and report on um, 
what the student um, is doing or what the student has done in the past, and even potentially what we expect the, the student to do in the future. So I would expect to see a student course record pop up at some point um, that says I'm registered in the course. Now, if I have um, uh, completed the course, either good or bad, um, then that will feed uh, into our grading services um, where um, I could be assigned or awarded a grade. And that too will roll up into the student course record of the academic record. So if you remember from the last session, the academic record is kind of a roll up of all of these transactions that are occurring um, within course registration and grading and many other services. That may again uh, percolate over to my program entry in the academic record service um, for things like how many credits uh, have I attempted this term, um, what are the total number of credits I've earned, and eventually my GPA calculation. But today, we're just gonna focus on course and course offering. So let's start with course. Um, so let's say that um, I'm defining a course and I know that I want to have a couple of pieces of that course, that there's going to be a lecture and there's going to be a discussion group. So we call these activities. And they basically describe the different kinds of activities from a curricular standpoint of that that is occurring in this course. These activities in turn are tied together into what we call a format. So I created a format, I just called it the traditional format, which always comes with a lecture and a discussion group. Um, there may be many other formats that one can create and of course can have more than one format, which means that it can be taught in different ways. So here I defined a new kind of format for um, an experimental mode of teaching where there is just one big study group that meets together um, and uh, learns the material in the class. There may be also an online format uh, where maybe it's done through uh, video conferencing or some other distance learning tool. Uh, you can have as many formats as you want, but it is expected that if a student were to register at an offering in any of these formats, um, that the same learning objectives defined at the course level are satisfied. So in other words, if Math 1801 is used as a prerequisite or a requirement for completing a program, then any of these formats will do. If that's not the case, then it kind of implies that that format is probably really a different course with different learning objectives. So this is an example of courses can be broken down to describe curriculum at a more granular level. We can go the other way and we can begin snapping courses together to make bigger pieces of curriculum or bigger courses. Um, so we like to call those multi-courses. So let's say that I wanted to combine uh, Math 1801 and, and Physics 801, and I wanted to think of it as a single piece of curriculum, even though I have two courses that already exist. Maybe I want to do that so I understand the curriculum better, I want to define learning objectives at a higher level, or I want to provide later on a single point of registration so that students are registered in both. So what we do is we take those two existing courses and we wrap them together in a multi-course structure. Multi-courses can be sequenced by term, so that can have an intent of saying, these are the courses as part of this multi-course registration that the student will take in, the, in a fall term, and then in the next spring term, they'll take the follow-on courses. And I can keep doing that um, as much as I want. 
Um, often when people start structuring courses like this, another name that people use is defining a lockstep program. And yes, a multi-course can contain other multi-courses um, so that I can build um, bigger and bigger pieces of curriculum. Um, and so even though programs are kind of out of scope, but if you um, have lockstep programs, um, this is the kind of mechanism you might be looking at. Now, learning objectives. So I come back to math 1801. Uh, we can assign learning objectives. And apologies uh, for those who have worked with me in learning objectives before. I always insist that learning objective name should always have a verb in it. Um, I didn't because the boxes are really small. So we have a learning objective about learning something about calculus. And Learning objectives, as Norm Wright would call it, are first class citizens. In other words, they are managed objects and they can be created and managed independently. Um, they can be related to the course, um, but they exist in their own right. Um, if those of you are familiar with uh, MIT's MC3 project, um, where uh, Jeff Merriman built a system that does nothing but manage learning objectives. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this area to describe and be able to translate material curriculum in one course and be able to understand its applicability um, in a course that may be offered elsewhere. So learning objectives are part of a hierarchy and they can be broken down and they could be broken down again. And you can keep breaking down those learning objectives um, into whatever detail you'd like. You can even begin splitting apart those learning objectives into different activities that are defined in the course. Consequently, you could also build up, but you will eventually get to a level of learning objective that may be suitable for understanding an entire program. And every learning objective, we can track results or competencies or what we call in the service environment here proficiencies um, for a student in how what they know about that learning objective. And that comes with its own grading scale. And we have results that are in grades that are the product of courses, but then we can come over to the learning objective side and understand what competencies the student actually has. So we can do that on either side. Another big chunk of curriculum management, um, you know, both in the core product and at Boston College is the workflow. So in a very straightforward environment, somebody can sit in front of an application and simply create courses and update courses. Um, but often in universities, uh, there is at the very least an approval process um, that must, um, where the course must travel, and that may also result in other activities or tasks uh, that one needs to do before that course goes into production. An update of the course um, can just change the information about that existing course, or we can create what we call a new revision of that course. And these are intended to be major changes to a course that may affect uh, its requirements or the requirements of where that course was applied. And so although we can have a revision history of a bunch of changes to a course where it has the same title and the same course code, um, internally in the system, we treat them actually at different courses. So the revision, say revision two, of Math 1801 uh, may not satisfy the core math requirement at the university, but it has been changed and revision three can be used to satisfy that requirement. So this is yet another dimension to curriculum management. But in, in course proposals, um, all workflow submissions are wrapped in a request, a course proposal request. Um, these course proposals, they may contain multiple line items um, so the capability exists so that multiple courses can 
be bundled together so that somebody is reviewing and approving the entire set of courses rather than seeing them come in one at a time. Um, or it may be wrapped um, in the same request that's part of a program proposal. So here's my new idea for a program and our committee came up with a bunch of courses and you should see the whole thing um, before approving it for offering. And re these requests may contain other information that are helpful for the workflow and approval process that's not and does not belong um, in the course itself. And so there may be justifications, or there may be other pieces of information to let people who are participating in that workflow know what to do. So a proposal for a request actually creates the course object. So we work on the course object from when the workflow starts all the way through to the very end. And so here we have a uh, proposal that somebody wants to create in economics class 3145. And while that person is putting in all the information and maybe thinking about learning objectives and thinking about what the description ought to be, it's sitting in a draft state, which means it's just visible to the person who is creating it, but it hasn't entered the approval process yet. Once it is submitted into workflow for approval, um, the first step is now inside the workflow engine. And by the way, Boston College, uh, we decided to take our workflow service interface definitions and implement them against the open source workflow engine activity. And so that's what we're currently using. And eventually it gets routed that request. Um, you know, based on roles and based on other rules in the workflow system um, to somebody who is going to approve or reject the course. And so here we are waiting for our approval. Uh, there it is, we are approved. And often um, there's some additional work that needs to be done. Maybe it's somebody else is in charge of assigning the course code or managing the cross listings or, or what have you. Um, but once we get to the end of the workflow, we now have an active course in the system. Now, how do we tell the system that we have an active course and it's ready to go? We actually create, we enable it for offering. And this little red box here, we call an offering enabler. And what it, and what it does is it describes all of the rules in which Econ 3145 may be offered. When does that start? Does it go on in perpetuity until we yank this offering enabler away? Or is it a pilot that we only wanna offer for one year? Um, which department is gonna be offering it? Uh, um, is it could be offered any time or is it a summer term only course? And what are the other constraints that will eventually govern um, what can happen with the course offering later in the uh, course life cycle? So a course offering, again, is just a course that is offered in a term. It looks a lot like the curriculum definition, except with all of the uh, logistical additions. And so anytime we talk about registration restrictions or time of day or anything else, we're really talking about doing that on the course offering side. Um, and we don't do that on the curriculum side. Um, and there's often a need that we want to um, kind of store some information or some data that we don't have to like enter that in to the course offering each and every term. Um, now we know rollover is one of the mechanisms in, in which things can be copied down from term to term, but the other place we stash that so we don't confuse the curriculum definition is we use those offering enabler rules uh, to put that information. And although I only talked about course offering, they're also offering counterparts for the formats and activities. Um, the activities, uh, we call those activity offerings on the offering side, and those are a lot like your session, session um, sections, excuse me. Um, and those will be, you know, where scheduling um, is very important. So can the course offering be changed from the curriculum definition? And I will say that that depends. 
um, at Boston College, uh, they have decided that there were only certain pieces of the course offering that they were willing to have vary from the curriculum definition. Um, and in our experience, you know, that is kind of seems relatively organized and, and, and tight. Um, I have worked with other schools where their policies are that a course offering may be changed any time and have nothing to do with its curriculum definition. Uh, a little bit more of the Wild West, if you will. Um, but those constraints are really managed by the rules that are implemented. And those rules are customizable. So if we look at the entire picture of the course, my little center circle here in red, um, these are all of the things um, that could be managed around a course uh, to make the complete picture. Um, so of course, we're talking about learning objectives. Uh, Dan will show how you assign uh, credits and grade results that are independently managed. They're offered by organizations, so we need to worry about where we get our organizational hierarchy from um, and services to do that and all the way around the circle. And so in an implementation study, this is, you know, from a curricular point of view, um, these are the different areas uh, that such a group would be looking at um, to try to understand, you know, how to set up and how to configure and how to customize um, to get courses ready to be offered in a term. Okay, and with that, I will hand it over to Dan so he can show you some real things in action. Thank you, Tom. And I am going to uh, share. All right, can uh, people see my screen here now? Yes, we can, Dan. Excellent. All right, uh, so, so Tom just uh, covered a lot of the different tools and mechanisms we're using for uh, setting up a semester and setting up a department's courses. Um, and, and, and I'm going to walk us through kind of the entire process of getting ready for a term, or at least most of it. Um, so to set a little bit of context here, the first, uh, the first step between setting up this uh, term is from uh, an administrative side. So we're, we're going to be looking as if we were in the registrar's office. Um, where the very first thing we are going to do is we're going to go over and uh, take a look at the academic calendar for a given term. So um, within our academic calendar, we want to make sure that we have our various uh, key dates set up for the upcoming term. So we see things, you know, uh, last day to withdraw from a class. Uh, we have add drop days, uh, last day of classes. Um, and beneath those, uh, we can have independently, um, we can have independent uh, subterms set up for each of these. So instead of just setting key dates for uh, everything at the kind of parent level, our parent terms here, fall, spring, and summer, um, we have each individual one that can each have their own uh, key dates associated with them. Uh, we can go in, we can uh, modify these and uh, make adjustments. Um, but then once we are actually ready to move forward uh, with our academic calendar for a year, 20, uh, so the 21, 22, uh, we are going to uh, do what's called a rollover, um, which we are going to take um, one of these terms. So we're actually going to take the fall of 2020 and roll it into the fall of 2021. Now it's a process that's going to recreate uh, the entirety of that fall term. It's going to include all of the um, format offerings, uh, course offerings, activity offerings, instructors, as well as the schedules of those courses themselves. Now we've already run one of these because it's a little bit, uh, so the process takes a, a fair bit of time to run. So I'm going to show you the results of the one that, that we ran here. So we actually ran this from 2018 fall into 2021 fall. And here we see the entirety of the semester for all of the courses. Now there is functionality that could allow us to do this on a smaller scale and roll over either a subterm or potentially even just department to department. But right now at BC, we're going to roll over the entirety of the term to include everything. Now you see, so we had, you know, 1870 course offerings that came over uh, as well as uh, 1869 formats and about 3750 as far as courses. Now we also see that we have a number of skipped items here. Um, if, if I scroll down, uh, this is 
this acts as our report um, as or, or an initial report around some of the details about what happened in that rollover. It initially starts out uh, to be configured. I just want to see the things that were skipped or I had an error on. And I see that, uh, you know, Europe and the world was actually canceled in the source term. So when the rollover went back and looked at that, it doesn't just copy the item from one term to the next, it actually attempts to recreate it. So if an instructor had retired, uh, it would appear here as the instructor didn't roll over because they're no longer active. If a room, uh, if we were doing construction on campus and there was a, uh, a room that went offline, then I would get a result here that said the scheduling uh, of this, of a specific section didn't roll over properly because that room, uh, that room got smaller and didn't fit into the course that was actually um, is supposed to go in there for the upcoming term. So, so those are the things that from behind the scenes, um, before departments get involved, we, uh, we as our you know, student services systems team are going to go in and be managing. Now, now once that is done, uh, we, are, uh, we will turn this over to the departments. Um, so once the departments uh, are going to um, are going to begin getting into this, we are going to switch context now. So I'm going to act as the department administrator for uh, for the Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, department. So this is my. I'm going to go in and take a look and. These are the courses that I'm going to be offering in the upcoming term as, uh, the, as Earth and Environmental Science. Um, I see a number of these indicators, a little bit more inf information about each of these. Something, uh, exploring the Earth has a co-requisite. Um, environmental issues and resources is cross-listed with, with another course. And we have a number of different things that we can display here about, the, uh, about these. But if, for example, I wanted to view my own rollover results within this department, um, I come over here and I get a better sense of, of what is actually happening here. I had 35 courses come over. I had 56 activity offerings and 26 exams attached to this. And when I go into the rollover that was actually run, get a little bit of info on the, um, on the larger sense of the term but, uh, for everybody. But then as I scroll down, I actually see the three items I have out there that did not roll over properly. So this is a starting point for a department that they might want to go in and take a look and evaluate what sort of information is there for their term. If I want to view everything that happened, um, I can uh, go and update this filter and then see my entire term, things that were created successfully as well as those that ended up getting skipped. I'm going to go back to my list of course offerings. And uh, over, we can say over the course of, of the past year, uh, we realized that there was an additional course that we want to offer in the upcoming term that we haven't offered before, that, hasn't, uh, that was never created, um, that we're going to create from scratch uh, to start out because it wasn't part of the rollover. And so I'm going to go in uh, and create a course. And we're gonna see, and within here, we're gonna see a lot of information and a lot of the, the items that Tom was just talking about previously. Um, so here, I'm gonna create uh, the geology. We're gonna create the geology of New England. And we, we have multiple titles here, that uh, titles and names here that can be displayed. We can keep these differently. We can uh, have some of them auto-generate if we're uh, looking to fill a specific standard. But right now, we're just going to use a consistent name. Um, for subject code, we're going to go Earth and Environmental Science. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail around uh, just typing in descriptions and things now. But we're gonna, this is going to be a, a roughly a junior level course. Now, we, we have some fields in here that aren't, nece aren't necessary for us. Um, these instructor fields here are not for the course, uh, the individual sections that are going to be taught, but are uh, instructors that will display on the catalog if we would like, um, if we would like that to display within our, uh, our catalog as well. Maybe a high profile instructor is teaching something that we want to make sure is always associated with this course. 
Uh, same thing goes for populations. I, I said it's going to be roughly a junior level course, but I'm not going to limit there and I'm not going to publish in the catalog that it's only supposed to be for them. It's going to be a course that lasts one semester. Um, and I'm going to say this course can be taken either letter or pass fail. Um, it is going to have a final exam. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a regular, a standard final exam. We have some different options on what, excuse me, on what we can do with final exams there. Um, and then for the number of credits, uh, I have my list here, and I'm going to say this is going to be actually a four credit course. That does, and it does not have a course fee. Um, let me go to my next screen here. Uh, so this is going to be an undergraduate level course, and uh, it's going to cover a natural science. Now, uh, this, this UI here is actually more to provide context for the person approving the course. Um, these aren't actually uh, the same uh, requirements that are going to drive our degree audit or anything else. This is informational. We are trying to build out all of the info around the course that's needed here. Um, so, so these are the two things that we want to have displayed with this course. Now, this, here we are seeing the format that we, um, that Tom was uh, discussing before. Um, and we're gonna say this course can be offered as a lecture um, because uh, we have one instructor that is only teaching 25 students, uh, but we also have a much larger um, way to offer this course that because the instructor can't give as much one-on-one -on -one help, we're gonna make it a lecture discussion as well. So there, there are multiple ways that this course can be consumed for full credit. Um, for a, uh, for a, a requisite here, um, I'm actually going to say that, uh, we're going to have a prerequisite for this. That's going to be, um, uh, want to make sure that, uh, people have taken exploring the earth before they've actually taken this, uh, before they've actually taken, um, this course. So, so I'm, I'm adding that and we'll see where it comes into play later. Um, now, maybe I, I also want to include a cross listing within this. Um, so it's, it's not only earth and environmental science, it's also the environmental studies department. It can be offered as either. And uh, so if a student was to search for this course, it's the same course, but it can be seen in multiple ways. If I want to provide any additional instructions to the, um, to, to the registrar's office, that's going to be proving that I can include that here. Now, this is the enabler that Tom was talking about earlier, where the first time um, we're going to be able to take this course is 2021. That's when this is first going to be available to us. Um, we're also going to include that it's going to be offered every single fall, uh, but we're not going to put additional restrictions on it right now. Now I'm going to go in, um, review. I can see the, uh, all of the information that I've, that I've just put in here. Um, it, it looks uh, it looks good. I, I can also see um, see uh, the catalog view of what would display here. Uh, this is um, another area. Just reviewing the data, seeing if I was updating this course, I would see what was here previously. And now I'm now I'm going to finish, and I am going to submit that course. Now, typically, this course would go for approval to the registrar's office. It would start off with the department and then move over into the registrar's office. Uh, we have this, um, we are going to assume that this was just approved and I'm going to go back over into my uh, course offering list now for um, uh, uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences. Now, um, I didn't just create that course in the term I was looking at. I created that course uh, just in the catalog view, in our curriculum. That course now exists at Boston College, but I want to make sure that that course is offered within the fall of 2021. So uh, I'm going to go in and take a look. And now I'm going to go into uh, and, and see some of my details. Now, these are most of these are settings that I just defined a moment ago. If I was to go in and I wanted to say that it was going to be pass fail instead by default, Here's where I'm setting a bunch of the defaults for the sections that I am creating beneath this. So I'm going to save this. And now it's going to bring me into the, to the screen where now I am managing all of the, um, the formats and sections of geology of New England for the fall of 2021. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a format. 
So these are the two formats that we had created before. We had a, both a lecture and a lecture discussion. Uh, I'm going to start off by creating a lecture, uh, lecture discussion here and taking, uh, just taking a look. I'm going to leave it letter graded, but I, could, um, but I could update that if I want. I could also add some additional restrictions. I'm going to leave that blank for now. I'm moving forward. And now I see that, so I have one format here. Um, so the format is really how this course is going to be consumed for us. Uh, and then we get into the sections, which are really what we think of it, that the student is, um, how the student's going to experience the course, where we get into details um, like, and I'm gonna start off by creating the lecture first, um, like the number of students that are going to be taking it. So, uh, so we're gonna say this course has, uh, 55 students that are that are going to be taking it. And now I have my my line item here where I'm going to first, uh, I know that we are going to have um, we're going to have uh, someone's going to need to be teaching this course. So we're going to go ahead and uh, So, so Linda McCarthy is going to be teaching us about the geology of New England. And I now have uh, have Linda here uh, teaching the course. If I actually was a little bit too high with this, I have some inline editing capabilities where I can drop this down to 50. And uh, but I'm not ready to actually move this into a new state of planned or anything yet because I'm the, the course is not fully set up. Um, I'm also going to uh, add two discussion groups for this course. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip the max enrollment for for the moment. Um, and I am now actually going to, to add a TA to teach these discussion groups. Um, and I think, I think I am actually going to be the one that's going to teach these, this section. Um, and so, so now I have a discussion group. I'm actually going to copy this one and duplicate it. So now that I have Two, two discussions and uh, and then this one lecture. Um, we're because it's oh, um, because we have uh, 50 seats in the main, we need to make sure that we have enough seats in our discussion se sections to actually line it up. And, and now we have this uh, and now we have uh, some of the initial information that's needed around uh, these uh, specific sections. Uh, you'll notice schedule is still blank. Uh, so the next thing that we actually need to go in to do is we're going to go and we are going to go schedule um, these these sections. Um, so the the way that we are handling sections is um, each department is going has their own uh, each department has their own inventory of um, items that they're going to be able uh, to access. So um, I need to quickly uh, refresh my page here. Um, sorry about that. Um, just give me one second. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we, we have um, something uh, small, so a small adjustment. Uh, the course that I just created uh, should immediately um, jump to right here. Uh, so uh, apologies for, for, that, um, for that bug, um, but we will still show uh, the, the scheduling of these items. Uh, so we can see that here that we have um, Earth and uh, uh, the living Earth is another section within this department. Now we have, uh, these are the items that are already scheduled for the, for the given term. Um, and then up here, we have any extra available rooms that uh, Earth Environmental Science uh, has available to them that they can potentially schedule rooms into. Um, we uh, have a couple of different ways we can do this. First, uh, we can go in and actually unassign rooms uh, ourselves. Now, a lot of what's going on here is going to be handled by our CAS, our central administrative scheduler. And uh, when the CAS gets in, she has full control over all of these different functions. But the ones uh, that are within the departments, they can really just manipulate their own schedules using the rooms that they already have. Um, and, and the way that they do that is by coming here and uh, I unassigning and then uh, 
taking, for example, this 80 person room that I am going to add here. When I create, I am now going to see this, um, this room get scheduled here, uh, here right for me. So, so we'll see that here. Um, additionally, if I don't have anything that was available here, I have a couple of other scheduling options uh, that I can use. So I just created a schedule assignment there. But if I wanted to annotate this schedule and do something different, uh, I can go in and uh, say that I'm going to make this one departmentally assigned, where I'm going to come in and choose these are the rooms that are available only to Earth and Environmental Sciences. These are these are some lab sections uh, that are out there that we know are uh, only for them. That the cast doesn't have capability. These are actually all labs. So um, this course isn't going to be set up as as a lab. So so I'm going to go back and instead. I could put uh, time only, but for this one, I'm just going to say by arrangement, which um, it, for Boston College means this course isn't going to get any schedule. Um, we are basically saying this department is going to uh, offer this course and they're going to be, um, the instructor will make the connections directly with the students. Uh, good examples of this are things like uh, senior theses and, um, uh, and uh, independent studies where they don't necessarily require a schedule. And then within here, we can actually see the list of items that we have for these, you know, by arrangement courses, as well as some lab schedules and, and some other items. Um, so once, uh, once all of this is done, um, we can, uh, we're gonna go back to our, um, to our course offering list here and, uh, and, and, and take a look. Uh, now, I see down here on my, um, I see a, a number of uh, different courses here, including um, uh, the one that we uh, just scheduled a second ago. Um, and and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, the uh, environmental issues and resources And, and apologies, I'm sorry. So the, uh, the, the, living, the living earth uh, one is, is the section that I actually wanted to go in and take a look at from my course offering list. Um, so I'm gonna go in and take a look at uh, 1180. Um, so within here, uh, I'm gonna go in and take another look at my course offering sections. And I see things like states and plans and uh, I'm going to go in and actually make this a uh, through my state change here, I'm going to make this, uh, I can cancel it for a semester or I can suspend it for a semester. So we have a number of, number of different state management steps that we can take here as well, which will add some additional uh, benefits to our, our, our next rollovers. A suspended course is something that we can have roll over from term to term, or we could have it not. It's all flexibility within our, our rollover manipulation. Um, so uh, with that, that's um, kind of a, a general setup. And we have all of these that are in various states uh, as well. Um, so between planned and offered and draft. And once something is actually in our uh, offered or planned state, we know it's going to roll over. But the departments are going to put it in a planned and then once the cast determines that the courses are all ready for the given semester, they will uh, run a, a state change in mass that will then get it into offered state that will then prepare it for the registration. Um, so so uh, thank you, apologize for that one scheduling issue that we ran across and um, uh, I'm going to um, turn it uh, back over to um, uh, Linda, Linda and Tom. All right, so Dan, if you stop sharing. Oh, yep, yeah, sorry. No problem. I will start up again. Oops.
I'm sure if Dan had enough time, he could, he could demo these applications for hours on end. There seem to be so many different facets to them. Uh, but I just wanted to um, uh, just close with a little bit about the flexible options, particularly as uh, this community begins thinking um, about the implementation study. And one thing I wanted to bring up, um, although Dan called it a department where you saw a listing of course offerings, um, this is part of a generic me mechanism that is part of the modeling in many of our services and growing, uh, we call it cataloging. And the catalog of course offerings is called a SOC. And that was an acronym that was too good to pass up. Um, so we decided it means sets of course offerings. And what, what a catalog does is it just provides a very flexible and either manual or rule-based way of making collections of objects for different purposes. So I'll give an example of the SOC catalog. Um, I can have a uh, spring 2021 set of course offerings uh, for the history department that has all of their stuff. Um, this provides a very simple way for us to kind of jump in and just zoom in on, on that set of course offerings um, without having to do searches on various criteria. Um, and it also provides us a way on, uh, on which to hang an authorization. And so we don't have to hang an authorization on each individual course offering to say, you know, who can update it, for example, or, you know, who could cancel it. Uh, we can hang that authorization at the SOC level. SOCs are hierarchical, um, as with all catalogs in Eagle Apps. And so this shows a bunch of departmental level SOCs on the bottom uh, with a uh, school level SOC, Arts and Sciences, up at top. And we can keep going. Uh, but these SOCs, we don't manually assign the courses uh, to the SOCs, so we have the option of doing that for doing some special case collections. Uh, most often we just implement rules. And so the SOCs that we have are largely based on, at this level, looking at what organization is offering this and what term is it. And then it's when we retrieve course offerings by that, um, by that set, um, we get all the ones that are relevant. So said differently, it's like having a baked in query into the system. Uh, that users don't have to type in themselves. All they need to do is select their SOC. We can keep going. We can include other schools. Uh, we eventually roll it up to something we call the Boston College SOC, of which we have one for every term. And we may then, in turn, um, uh, do, you know, over time, uh, spring 2021, 2022, and so forth. Uh, there is a, a languages department, and uh, they have subject areas within the department. So administratively, it's one department, but you have a bunch of languages under there, and those are subject areas. So we just include in the rule that says if there are more than one subject area um, that is underneath that organization, you know, let's see that. And so the language department can look at all of their course offerings by selecting their departmental SOC, but they can also see other selections that say, you know what, I just want to focus on the French courses right now. And let me see that. So these catalogs, is, they're basically a way of controlling scope through the process of selection. And here we go. We've included uh, uh, some other terms. And when we talk about the course offering process, you know, although people are generally working at one course offering at a time, we want to be able to roll it up and kind of see where we are um, and see where we are and what the state of the term is in itself. Um, so, you know, in this case, okay, assuming it was next year, uh, fall 2021, uh, that SOC for Boston College means classes are in progress, might be one example state that we have there. Um, in the summer of 2021, um, that's in draft, you know, they maybe just did a rollover, just people are just starting to look at it and, and you know, get things prepared. Um, but maybe the spring 2021, 
you know, that's active inactive preparation. And so people are doing their scheduling and assigning their instructors um, and, you know, verifying what courses they're actually going to offer for that term. So that's at a high level, but we can drop down and maybe, for example, the law school wants to have a different registration period. Um, and they want to push their sock ahead of the rest of the pack. Um, sometimes that happens with the, the medical school or the law school, or in the case of Boston College, uh, the Wood School. Just, I don't know why this is doing this to me here. So the um, breaking down into smaller sets of course offerings and understanding their state, uh, we can also drill down and see during the course offering editing process, well, perhaps which departments have marked their SOC as complete. Like, I'm ready to go. We did all our stuff. We're ready for registration. And maybe the next SOC over, well, maybe they still have a lot of work to do. Um, and so it gives us a way of kind of tracking progress throughout the university. So these catalogs, and in particular, specifically these SOCs, are also a tool for delegation and managing a situation where things get broken up into a bunch of different departments and a bunch of different people, but then how do we manage it as a whole? Okay, get on to the next slide here. So the rules for how to um, create these catalogs in a hierarchical structure, and specifically the SOCs are completely customizable. Um, anyone may inject um, their own code uh, to do something a little bit different. The big advantage is it avoids tedious searching of the entire university um, by trying to look up attributes and select departments and orgs and people and times of day in order to find your stuff. So we can create a nice little folder um, for a small department and say, all of your stuff is here. Go find it. Um, and it's very helpful uh, for us to manage uh, authorizations, as I've said before. And it works hand in hand um, with workflow or any kind of state model where we want to track the a state of a set of these course offerings. Um, a little bit about the um, academic calendar. Um, the academic calendar, for all intents and purposes, is simply a collection of terms and milestones. You know, milestones are basically dates with names and descriptions. Um, so therefore, the terms and the milestones may appear on multiple academic calendars. Now, Boston College has only implemented one academic calendar per academic year, um, but the system has the capability of managing multiple academic calendars in the same year. Um, and that may be helpful for um, an institution that has a school, again, that's marching a little bit to its own beat, um, maybe by having different registration periods or maybe even different class periods. And consequently, we can go the other way and we can have academic calendars that span multiple years as well. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, from a, a, a systems perspective, um, these things are really just collections of stuff and we can arrange it um, uh, you know, any number of ways. Uh, the other thing where Dan was looking at uh, pass fail and letter grades, um, all of these are called results and they're managed in a learning result catalog. Um, we tend to abbreviate that with LRC. And the job of the learning result catalog is to provide a place to manage all enumerated result values. And that's anything you can imagine, um, grades, test scores, SAT scores, GPAs, um, even degrees, certificates, um, badges. And uh, these values can be grouped together. And so it was one of these result values groups that Dan was selecting from um, when he was selecting uh, pass, fail, or grades. So even GPAs are enumerated, um, they can be done algorithmically, um, but they can also be enumerated so that um, we can define very clearly, not just the precision in the learning result catalog of how many decimal places we need, um, but they can also be nonlinear and they can be dis and, and discontinuous. Um, so maybe um, everything below a GPA of 1.0, we just count by uh, a quarter of a point, 
um, and then everything above a 1, 1 1.0, we count, you know, we, we want to now start counting by a tenth of a point. And all of that is possible in the learning result catalog. So um, when I'm defining, of course, uh, Math 1100, um, I get to select the result values group. In this case, I selected one that had uh, some familiar letter grades into it. But maybe a different kind of course. And um, you know, I have this kind of course that I use for freshman seminars. Um, and maybe they're not intended to be for grades. Um, and so I select a, a pass-fail option there. And the School of Management is doing some continuing education professional workshop um, where, you know, we're basically uh, 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 selling materials for working professionals and they get to hang a certificate on their wall after they complete the course. Just a different kind of result from the system point of view. So in defining the curriculum, I might want to think about having different types. Remember the first session we talked about every object has a type. Um, that is one of the ways the system can be configured. And those types, one of the main jobs of a type is not just to identify what, you know, what kind of thing it is, um, but we also link metadata and constraints and other rules to that type. So in this case, I assigned a type to each one of these types of courses. And now when I'm creating a credit course, maybe my only options are to do it for letters or do it for pass fail. I don't have any other option. And maybe for a seminar, it's constrained so that I can only create it pass fail and so forth. And so the type system and the constraints and what we're selecting, they could be woven together, um, not only to make data entry simpler and more robust, um, but also it helps us think about what kind of thing it is and, and what its purpose in life is. What we don't want to do is create a credit course and say, you're going to be graded on a professional teaching certificate, right? We don't want to mix those result values around. Um, and uh, what do I have here? Um, so before I do that, let me just uh, give you a little picture of the learning result catalog here. And these are all the different result value groups that we have. And you see they're organized by scale, um, certificates, uh, credits, um, endorsements, GPAs, grade scales, learning objectives for those uh, proficiencies. So we can grade their competencies, um, standardized test scores. Um, if I look at AP, uh, there it is, their AP test scores, and we have a scale of one through five. And each of these is a possible result value that can be assigned to a student who took an AP test. However, if they uh, uh, took a, uh, the SATs as a different kind of test, we would link that to a different result values group that would have valid results for a, an SAT. Uh, it's not my place here. Uh, the type system, so one of the, we can use that with metadata to constrain um, what the possible things that make sense for that type of course is, like credit values or other kind of result values. Uh, we could use it, as Dan showed, to constrain um, what it is that's even applicable um, in that particular situation. So we can kind of make things go invisible and visible um, based on the type. Um, we can also begin to relate types together. Think about the course process going from the courses, which have structures of formats and activities, and then they all have offering counterparts. I can begin to simplify that process by creating these relationships in the system um, among the types. So for a credit course, I may already know that you know, these are the only allowed activity types for a credit course, and maybe it's a lecture discussion group in a lab. Um, and there would, of course, would have to fall under the appropriate type for the format as well. Um, 
and maybe the executive workshop type um, only allows activity types of online uh, learning or an in-class lecture. Um, so I can begin to kind of hone in so that we're not looking at a whole morass of different possibilities when we already know what it is that we wanted to create in the first place. And similarly, I can use the same mechanism, and we do, um, to constrain what can happen on the offering side. And look at that, I spelled offering wrong. But um, on the uh, left column here are my uh, curriculum uh, activity types, and on the right are the activity offering or the section types. And maybe more, most often than not, it's kind of one for one. You know, lecture, lecture, discussion, discussion group. But here I just demonstrate that they can be different um, and we can link them together. Um, so, for example, for lab, um, maybe we want to drill down in the offering because certain kind of labs require a certain special uh, training session, orientation session, and we want to know that um, when people are registered there. And I can break that down um, into multiple smaller types. So I can mix and match a little bit, and it's really just saying what is allowed, and all of that is completely configured through the UI. And I can get my type UI up here. Um, so here I've listed the um, activity types that are currently um, in the Boston College data, data set. Um, and you can see there's everything from um, independent study, hybrid lab, lecture, online, practicums recitations and studios. And then as I scroll down here, um, I can see some of its relationships. And the relationships that are actually popping up aren't uh, talking about constraints, it's actually talking about a different kind of type uh, that we use in the operation of the system, is that what does one produce? So what I uh, snuck in here before, let me go back to this slide. Uh, that's a lot of activity type. So it's the format type column. And you see it's kind of echoing a little bit on what the activity type is. And so if we selected a lecture lab format type, the, pro the production type tells the system, you know what, they want a lecture and they want a lab. Please don't make them go create, 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 create. Just, just make it happen. Um, and so a lecture lab type produces an activity of a lecture and an activity of a lab, and that's automated in the system. And so that's one example that, you know, in our discussions and testing and back and forth, you know, we get feedback that something's a little too clunky or something takes a little bit too much time or the users don't know why they're doing this. It's a way for us to start now bringing automation and other uh, types of rules to the table. And so we always are looking at mechanisms like this to implement that automation. So um, last note, Dan uh, uh, talked about scheduling a little bit. I just wanted to have a little note on this. I think this is uh, several webinars in its own right. Scheduling is very complex, but it is actually a distinct area um, from course offering. Um, and through the uh, scheduling uh, interfaces, the integration points, um, we can implement any number of things. And I listed some examples. In some cases, we can manually just say, um, this is when we're offering it and it's going to be at this location. We can manage scheduling assignments in an external scheduling system like Ed Astra, for example, or Schedule 25. Uh, we can say, well, we already did the scheduling all these years. And so whatever was kind of scheduled last term, uh, why don't we just use those schedules this term and work from there so we can copy them through the rollover process from a previous term. Or, you know, maybe you implement using these interfaces your own room allocation system it says, you know, which departments can schedule uh, or use that room at what times of day. It turns out that BC uses a little bit of all of the above. Um, and uh, I was going to say it didn't offer number two, um, but I know there's been some interest in at least doing reporting in an external scheduling system to sort of understand its room uh, resourcing. So. Um, you know, there's, in our world, you know, there's almost never um, uh, this or that. It's always this and that and the other thing. 
So another um, huge area of, of customization and probably going to be a very uh, large concern um, for any implementation study of Eagle Apps will be the scheduling area. And so with that, I will actually hand it over to Linda McCarthy, who will talk, talk more about the implementation of curriculum management and course offering at Boston College. And Tom, before you leave, uh -huh. I'm having a technical difficulty trying to input the answer to a question, so I thought I could read it and you could answer the question. So, given that courses have learning objectives, are fulfillments of objectives a type of learning result? And if so, can a student record display a grouped list of fulfilled learning objectives? Um, yes, if we are tracking um, uh, proficiencies on learning objectives, um, you know, we should be able to display that. Boston College does a little bit of that today uh, because that's how we track what languages a uh, student understands and whether they understand that language natively or they have passed a second language test. Um, they're all managed through learning objectives and proficiencies. Um, and uh, we'll probably see that in the future um, when we uh, look deeper into students. But yes, results can be tracked and recorded um, for learning objectives that are accomplished. Thank you. All right, I have no slides. Uh, I'm Linda McCarthy. I am the ITS Technical Director for Student uh, Academic Systems. Um, and work closely with um, Jen Mack, Dan Higgins, and uh, a number of other people in the student services group. So as Mike Burke um, in his opening remarks talked about the fact that we were looking for a system that we could implement in a modular um, fashion, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the approach that um, Boston College has taken with the Eagle Apps uh, system. So we first started, um, as Dan showed you, uh, we implemented curriculum management courses. We moved the creation, the update, and the retirement of courses off of our mainframe system, which is 40 plus years old right now. And we did three integrations to, with that um, course module. We integrated it to uh, a system we call our um, operational data store. It's, it's an, a system where other systems need to use specific pieces of data. So uh, the source system would send that data up and then any other uh, systems could subscribe to that data. Uh, we also use this to help generate our course catalog. And the most important integration that we did was back to our mainframe because as everything else on the student information system was still being done on the mainframe, uh, the mainframe did need courses so that we could do our course offerings up there. We also did a workflow process through this curriculum management so that we could, um, as Dan showed you, you create the course. Um, because Dan's in student services, you didn't see where it ended up uh, a course request would go to student services for them to approve. They could also send that back to um, back to the requester asking for some additional information. The second module that we implemented was our student account system. This is, this is a system that allows us to generate charges, process, processes charges from other systems, it processes payments, it does refunds, um, and a whole host of other things. One of the huge benefits of putting this module in ahead of time was that it allowed the student accounts functional team to write and update the rules for their tuition and fee calcs. Previously, every time they needed a change, we would have to have a developer go into our um, PL1 code. And sometimes they would get a request to change tuition and fee rules and they would go back, you know, come back, say, first thing that they would say is, well, you know what, I have to go back to IT to see if that's even possible. So now they have full control over that. They test it. We have a process that they go through to get it migrated from dev to QA and ultimately up to uh, production. We did more integrations to this uh, with this module. Obviously, we had to integrate it back to the mainframe uh, to take care of uh, the rest of the items on the mainframe. We have a PeopleSoft financial systems. 
and there we did an integration to that system. We have Nelnet as a, uh, a vendor that, ha that helps us do refunds, payment processing, and we also have a variety of subsystems that supply charges um, to student accounts, such as health services, um, parking, library. And it has a direct integration between our financial aid system, which is another, which is a vendor product, ProSAM, and student accounts. So as a student is getting a financial aid award, it goes over through a service to student accounts to go look and see how my, you know, what are the charges that they have on their account so that we're not giving them more financial aid than they're um, being charged for. The last thing I just want to quickly talk about is the plan that we have when we have, uh, when we're going to start to roll out the enrollment modules, including the course offering, a uh, new version of, cor of CM courses. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of, we're going to follow our academic calendar. So the first set of activities that we do um, to set up for a new year is really reviewing our courses, adding any courses that we need to, retiring those courses, doing the whole setup as Dan showed for the course offering. Then we'll do programs. We'll do the academic record. Now that's the place where you're gonna be able to see what programs the student's in, some contact information, profile information, and a variety of other um, information. And that'll be in an upcoming session that we do. Um, advising, registration, and then the last two will be grading and graduation. So this system has made it very flexible for us to be able to implement it piece by piece as opposed to be able, you know, doing it all in a, in a big bang. Um, big bang approach. The other thing that it has helped us with is we also have a portal that we have different services that students use. And when we put the student accounts module in, the portal wouldn't have to rewrite code. They would just call the service to go grab whatever information that they either needed from the student accounts module or that they were sending to the, the student accounts module. All right, Tom, I don't know if you're next or I'm, I'm going to turn it back um, to you or to Dale. Okay, so I, I will hand it to Dale. I think we start our question and answer. Yep, that would be great. So if anyone, we have answered a few questions throughout um, and Linda picked up one live, so thank you for that. But if anyone does have any questions at this time, you can either submit them via chat or the Q&A button and we'll try to address them. As you do that, I will um also provide some additional logistics and help us to um close down these sessions again this is the first um uh, first of all thank you to tom dan and linda and the team behind the scenes who have worked to put these together with dextera and boston college um, this is the first of a series that really want to, uh, we wanted to make sure we could highlight and give you a sense of, or sh highlight a slice of, in this case, functionality. Um, our next session coming up uh, is more on the technical side to give you a sense of that with the customization and configuration of Eagle Apps. Um, uh, and then we continue with pro another uh, functional area with program management and academic records. And then we will talk about, oops, sorry about that, wrong button. And then we will talk more about the Eagle Labs community, community implementation studies uh, that we are have folks who are interested in participating in. Again, as a reminder, um, we are uh, growing a shared community with Boston College. Dexter is leading it um, to really have folks from around the world who can be engaged in this community and provide guidance on the long range plan, the model for implementation, support and maintenance, ongoing development and the roadmap forward and leading us to, again, the May 7th session about understanding what an implementation study is. We are eager and want all of you to be uh, able to join with us in this community to help shape the future of this evolving next generation system. We do think it'll change, have an influence on the market and have the ability to change the market, but in particular allow uh, institutions and educational entities greater control through an incremental deployment of this service-based approach. More details on the community uh, are continuing to be provided. We are getting input from folks as well on how to shape that. 
Um, let me see if there are any questions that have come in. Uh, does not look to be any. And I'm And I don't see any on the chat either. I, if anyone is wrong on that, I appreciate it. Could let me know. All of these recordings um, of our webinars, uh, again, from the introductory session or the overview on the 19th of March, today's session and all to come will be posted on the uh, Eagle Lab site within Dexterra, the Eagle Labs page within the Dexterra site. You can also email us directly at eaglelabs at dexterra.org. Um, we hope that you're able to join us for the next session. Um, we would ask that you share this information with others in your network who may be interested in learning more about Eagle Apps. We seek to provide each of these sessions within uh, 75 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on the topic and the conversations that go on. But if there are no additional questions at this time, I wanna thank you for joining Boston College and Dextera for this Eagle Apps webinar uh, event. Uh, we look forward to uh, having you as part of our community going forward.